There is an excellent group on Facebook, of all places, called Tantra Wisdom. Tantra as in Tantra, wisdom as in the wisdom of the ages flutters through its pages. That kind of wisdom. And it's really a fine, fine group. It is organized and moderated by a friend of mine and my <laughs> dear friend, actually, and unindicted co-conspirator, Anita Di Francesco, who is, amongst many other things, a somatic psychotherapist. So she brings a level of expertise beyond as being a student, so to speak, of Tantra and its practices. I feel that it is nevertheless incumbent upon me to emphasize that Anita, Anita Di Francesco, is a renowned teacher of Tantra, recognized as such throughout the country and throughout the world. Wherever the word Tantra is spoken, you are very likely to hear the name Anita Di Francesco. For the sake of good order, I should emphasize here that, although I'm a great admirer of Anita Di Francesco, the views stated in my podcast, either in this episode or elsewhere, are strictly my own and those of the scholars, authors, philosophers, and researchers whom I quote. So if you wish to know what Anita Di Francesco thinks about things and has to say about them, please refer to her podcast, which is Discover Joyous Love, to her webpage, tantrawisdom.com, and to her Facebook business page, Tantra Wisdom. Anita shared something in the Tantra Wisdom group which I found quite interesting. It was an article, a piece online, suggesting a number of ways. I think there was quite a lot of them, like 50 ways. Uh, with, actually, not such, it's not such a thing as ways so much as questions that they suggest that you ask someone you are considering becoming intimate with, considering perhaps becoming involved with, something along those lines. And the questions were all very good. I actually... Uh, commented on this uh, on this post in the Facebook group, and I said, well, I have some other questions that I think are really important that I would like to add. One of those questions is, what does the word spirituality mean to you? Let's start, let's start with that one. It's a really interesting question because some people outside of the, kind of the bubble that we live in are people who speak spiritual. It's like a whole different language, you know, that many people don't speak spiritual at all. You go into what they used to call the five and dime, and they don't speak spiritual there. They really, really don't. In the hardware store, they don't speak spiritual. They need It's like spiritual as a third language, something along those lines. But what does spiritual mean to you, and what kind of answer are you likely to get? Well, I'm an agnostic. That's kind of a typical kind of answer that people would give. Or, I was brought up Jewish, and I was bar mitzvahed, and all of that. And then I left home to go to college, and after that, it's like it seemed not so relevant to my life. Or, I'm what they call a lapsed Catholic. And I don't do the confession thing, and I don't go to Mass all the time, but I do on special occasions. Palm Sunday, Easter, you know the deal. And then there are the religious survivors, I will call them, for whom childhood and teenage religious quote-unquote experiences have colored their entire lives. Perhaps if you go out into the general population, they're not that well-known or visible. I've known several of them. Alas, these are mainly people who got quote-unquote messed up by various aspects of Christianity, either by an intense and overexertive application of what their parents and others in their lives deem to be the Ten Commandments. And we've done a whole segment on the Ten Commandments. Back a while ago, their origin is, and their meaning is, not what many people believe them to be. It's a little bit different. The history is a little bit different. But, I mean, these are kids, children who are seriously messed up in how the rest of their lives go 
each case is kind of individual. I knew a very well, I knew a woman very, very well, who got very involved in a kind of, not exactly evangelical, but sort of, church in a small town where she was living. And she became very close to the pastor slash youth leader of that church, who I believe would encourage a lot of dependency on the part of the teens and preteens of whom he was the pastor or youth leader. And when her parents moved to a larger city, she felt very estranged from everything in her life. She felt that she really needed that particular context, and it could not easily be replaced by simply going to a church. That wasn't the deal. So she actually went back for a while and lived in a group home type of facility that this pastor, but also youth leader, led. Was there anything sexual, you ask? Well, she did not elaborate on that. She did not say whether there was or wasn't. But sexuality means different things to different people. Sexuality, or rather people can exert, express their sexuality, sadly, simply through control, simply through dominance, yea, verily, S&M, simply by forcing the vulnerable, in this case children, to accept their idea of things, to accept the notion that they are in charge, and also that they will have extreme withdrawal symptoms if they leave this particular person, or in some cases organization. It's a dangerous kind of deal. Um, I have not studied what happens in uh, in the Muslim faith, and if there are situations like that, I have, as part of a psychological study, studied the Sikh uh, organization and uh, how they bring up their children, which involves actually a lot of sensory deprivation when the children are very, very young. They're not supposed to see anything but white. Strange things that are imposed on young children and their long-term effects. I don't think we studied, we did not study these children past third or fourth grade, even not even that far. So I don't know what happened to them. But this type of person who is messed up through their lives, and you meet them, and they have the sense of survivors. In many cases, they're looking for other religions, and they become exceptionally devoted to those other religions, even if those religions had nothing to do with the religion in which they brought up. As a matter of fact, they're they looking for religions which are the antithesis, in many cases, of the religion in which they were brought up. I, I've got to tell you, I didn't have that problem because my father wanted to have everything perfect. And of course, many things turn out to be just the opposite. But he, had, he wanted to have everything perfect, so he sort, sort of shopped around. He had an audience with the Pope, and I don't know what else he considered, a bunch of things. And he came around to the Anglican faith, which was the faith of the English side of his family, which is the Episcopal Church in the United States. And I went through all that. I, um, I was confirmed. The instructor of the confirmation class said, oh, you must be a joy to your teachers, because he hadn't really encountered a proto-intellectual before. I was weird to him. But then, you know, my parents didn't, feel that they, they were okay driving me to confirmation class, but they really didn't like going to church. So I didn't feel like walking three miles or longer on Sunday mornings to be a kid going to church by himself. So that was my last encounter pretty much with the Episcopal faith until I asked my fiance to marry me in a small chapel at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, while an angelic choir sang elsewhere in the church. And the priest, woman priest, wonderful woman, who had just given us communion, and I said to her, you know, this has it's been a long time since I've done this, and she said, welcome back. And I did kind of feel that I belong there. And in a certain way, I still do. 
So these are the questions that, or rather, these are the answers that people would give you, and it strikes me as those are kind of non-answers because they don't really get to the issue of what spirituality means to you. Oh, I should say, the worst one is, the worst one of all is, I'm a Buddhist. And people say that with great aplomb, and also with a kind of superior attitude to, you know, everyone else, I'm a Buddhist. But, golly, I mean, there's so many shades and strains of Buddhism. Tantra Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, which is a very ascetic so many people think of Buddhism and they think of something very ascetic, meaning no pleasure, no fun, no good food, you know, living almost silently, sometimes really silently, someplace in an ashram, with very little human contact. That's one kind of Buddhism. And then there's Tantra, which people identify with orgies. But I mean, that's not what it's about, really. I read a book on Buddhism, one of many I've read on the subject, and if I could find it amongst my 5,936,035 books, I would be able to tell you the title and even quote from it. But this book on Buddhism was basically about the transformation of the Buddha as a kind of spiritual leader uh, or wise man or thinker or someone who sat and chatted with people into, into a leader of a religion, so to speak. Interesting book. And this book discusses quite specifically whether becoming a religious leader was Siddhartha's, Gautama Buddha, as we know him, idea in any way from the beginning. And when during his existence this idea developed, or if it did at all, in any event, it is agreed by everyone that there are no texts surviving. In fact, there were no texts written about the Buddha, Gautama Buddha, Siddhartha, during his lifetime or for one or two centuries afterwards. And then we should bear in mind that when we talk about the Buddha, Siddhartha, Gautama Buddha, we are really talking about two people the one who actually lived on this earth and did various things during his lifetime, the historical Buddha, and the other Buddha, the Buddha around whose name and image and thought as it was transmitted over the course of time, perhaps long after his death, that other Buddha around whom, around whose image, around whose thought, organized things, came into being, more in the line of monasteries, more in the line of texts around which, again, various forms of meditation, religion, things along those lines, precepts for being, were organized. It is thought that the Buddha founded a monastic order during his lifetime, it is believed that he did. But beyond that, what do we really know? Uh, we have authorities we can ask that question to. It's, I'm not one. So these are the kinds of things that people say when they talk about Buddhism. And actually, there was a, a kind of development of Buddhism in which there was this guy, and he said certain things, and there's really, really a lot of scholarship going on as to what he really said and what he didn't say, and I've, I've read quite a bit of it. There was a, a quote from something that the Buddha said at some point, maybe early in his life, that I quoted in a previous episode, which seemed to imply that either polyandry or polygamy was accepted by him. It's a it's polymorphous sex. It's very interesting. But, you know, the whole business of the Buddha as a little statue, in effect, the Buddha is an idol. You spend time with that little idol, and you're supposed to, you know, be very calm. You meditate with the Buddha there, with this little idol. And is that how the Buddha, you know, Gotama Buddha, really imagined that his thought would develop? It's almost like the Buddha is like another... I'm going to say it, another Messiah, you know, Jesus, a Messiah. 
Muhammad a Messiah. He's a really interesting one. I have quite a few Muslim friends, and what they always tell me is, you know, Christians really, there's so many disputes about the Gospels. We've talked about that here. We've talked about the Gospel of Thomas, which is really, really old. And in the Gospel of Thomas, probably older than the Synoptic Gospels, as they're known, the ones that are in the Bible, Jesus said things that were kind of misogynistic on the one hand, and Jesus said things that were kind of pantheistic on the other hand. Things like, I am in the water, I am in the trees. I'm not quoting directly. I'm in the plants. Again, the sort of pantheism that God is everywhere in this world where we live. That is not, you know, if you read the uh, the Nicene Creed, as me as an, uh, as an Episcopalian had to learn and recite, that sort of talk is not in there. You know, but on the other hand, Muhammad, we know exactly what he says. We know exactly. There's disputes, not really disputes, there's a lot of scholarship that goes on. As a matter of fact, the Taliban, the Taliban means the scholars. You know, and many people know that, others don't. In Judaism, there's a lot of scholarship around the Torah. And people claim to have, and I have no doubt that they do, deep inspiration and deep layers of comple complex and interesting thought around what is in the Torah. But we're going to, whoa, weave ourselves way back to this, to this notion of what does spirituality mean to you? I was engaged to a woman for a while, and uh, we had a very interesting relationship, and she posted on one of these sites, you know, my upcoming marriage. And she had a whole page where she said, I am a very spiritual person, but sort of like not in the standard way. Here is, in fact, what my fiancé posted online on something called The Wedding Channel. I believe that I am a person who doesn't take herself too seriously but I do feel myself to be a deeply spiritual person. Spiritual, not to be confused with religious, because I have found that I have never fit in the mold of any one particular organized religion and maybe lack the discipline to conform to any guidelines of these at all. I believe in the power of my inner feelings, the guidance of the light that lives within me. I try very hard to be open and receptive to what some call the little small voice inside. I feel strongly that I was guided to Randolph, that this is fate. When I was young, I would draw in pencil and charcoal pictures of a man's face resembling Randolph. I don't think this is an accident. Also, his views and feelings resonate with me in such a very deep and extremely powerful way and on so many levels and on so many topics that are intimate to me and to whom I am. I find this very interesting reflection of an extremely intelligent person approaching the issue of spirituality. And I think deep down, if intelligent people who are questioning about the universe and questioning about where they fit in. This is a type of thing that they would say and, uh, and they would write and they would feel in the context of a relationship. Alas, the relationship did not last. She felt that I had a wandering eye and okay, I do, I appreciate beautiful women, but to have a wandering eye is not the same as to have a, you know, wandering physicality, if you want to call it that, a wandering expressed sexuality. It's interesting, but I mean, she re really was grappling with the idea of spirituality. And then there's my Porsche and Mercedes mechanic, wonderful German man, who mentioned a couple of times that he is something like a fifth degree Mason. And I don't know too much about the Masons. There are people who are very negative about them and people who are quite in favor of them, but it's interesting. You run into someone who talked about having to drive a great distance to 
attend Masonic meetings and the ceremonies that they have. And then occasionally one runs into somebody who is involved in the OTO, Wikipedia. Don't Google it. The greatest religious leader ever will be the one who can show us ways to go on our phones or on our computers now even. It gets worse and worse without someone trying to sell us something, a product. Because we are the product. Our eyeballs are the product. Our minds are the product. Our minds are what is for sale. The corporations, the politicians, the governments want to buy our minds in a certain way. Scary times. But the people are interested in the, in the OTO, and uh, I get invited to the Gnostic Mass somewhere on Instagram. Well, why not? I've never been to the Gnostic Mass, although I studied Gnosticism in graduate school and at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. So I know as much about Gnosticism and the Nag Hammadi texts and the other related texts to Gnosticism as just about anybody having read them, of course, in the original Coptic. Whereas, you know, Buddhism, on the other hand, People forget that the Western world was introduced to the idea of Buddhism, that is, the European world, to a large extent by a philosopher named Arthur Schopenhauer in his book, The World is Well on Representation and Elsewhere. And we've talked about Arthur Schopenhauer quite a lot. You can go back to my previous episodes and you can revisit old Arthur. But he was a profoundly pessimistic philosopher. And his pessimism, he claimed, with some accuracy, was largely derived from his study of Buddhism. He's the guy, we quoted before, who said, lovers are traitors who seek to perpetuate all the want and misery of life, which would otherwise come speedily to an end. So, Schopenhauer. So, Pessimism. I'm one of those odd kind of people who has total memory, not necessarily a day by day or events. A close friend was over here the other day speaking about concerts that we'd been to quite a few years ago and people we'd met and artists we'd seen and our reactions. And I could pull up some of it, a great deal of it, if truth be told piano concerts with music by Jean Barraquet, Milton Babbitt, Hans Eisler, the wonderful artists, some still with us, some gone, Marnie Nixon, the extraordinary composer Aribert Reimann on the piano, the composer of such wonderful operas as Lear and Medea, Ernst Krennic there in the audience, the look of things, Chats with Nuria Schoenberg. Wonderful things. You know, I had other kind of emotions running through my head at that time, largely relating to my uh, love for this person. But way back when, going back into earliest childhood, infancy, and actually back into the womb, strangely enough, and even before, even more strangely, But through my earliest memories, I always had the feeling that there was something wrong. And I vacillated over the years through the belief that there was something wrong with the universe or that there was something wrong with me. Going back and forth, silly thing. Not so silly, actually. And I was quite convinced of this, of some fundamental wrongness. And then in the third volume of my Sophia Tetralogy, I explain, my dear reader, exactly what is wrong. Yes, there is something wrong. And you can find out. You can pre-order my Sophia Tetralogy from Amazon or from any fine online bookseller or local bookseller. So check it out. So, that's the question of what is spirituality. And it's a challenging question. 
But it's a challenging question because it helps you get more deeply into what your potentially or actually intimate person thinks. And it's a great, great conversation for a couple. I've had that experience. And it was a very rewarding conversation. It's an ongoing conversation that couples can have. And there's no, there's no, how can I say, there's no resolution to it. Excellent kind of conversation. Because in experiences that we have as individuals and as a couple, many of us are seeking the spiritual aspect, seeking the spiritual renewal of that, that, that derives from that experience. And it's a good thing to do because there's so much in nature. You walk around nature and you see beautiful things. Spiritual renewal. You're going to a music performance. Spiritual renewal. You are meditating, and meditation with your couple person is a really, really interesting experience. In my opinion, more interesting than meditating alone, but I'm not going to uh, be in the majority in, in, in thinking that. So, what is or rather not what is spirituality, but what does spirituality mean to you? Then I added several other questions, but the, one I'll, the second one I'll bring up here is, what does sensuality mean to you? Oh boy, here we are on the Explore Ecstatic Sensuality podcast, and we're asking this. Well, like, yeah, of course we're asking that. And if people say, well, you know, I know what sensuality means, it's like, oh, touchy-feely kind of a thing. They won't necessarily say touchy-feely, but, you know, that's the general sense of things. It's, oh, it's, you know, uh, contact with another person. It's caresses. Or maybe they'll go out, out into nature again or food. Oh, it's a very sensuous experience. I drove it, or rather, I uh, had a glass of wonderful wine the other night. That was a sensuous experience. You know, well, again, hello... We're not getting to the essence of the sensual in saying these things or asking these things or looking at things that way. Not at all. And again, it's like if you say, I don't have to, a to ask that question, I know already, and in fact, you don't know. It's like, what does spirituality mean to you? And Well, in fact, you don't know. What does love mean to you? And in fact, you don't know. Or there's catchphrases that you can pull out of somebody's hat of things you've heard or things people have said or feelings you've had from time to time. But what does love as a concept, as an idea, as an activity, as a mode of being, what does love mean to you? Good question. What does sensuality mean to you? I could give you a little lecture, but the point of this little episode is not to give lectures. It's more to ask questions. Another way of saying this is how can you bring more sensuality into your life? Because in a certain way, if it's not in your life, generally speaking, then how do you expect it to be in your sex life, in your relationship? You can't live a life in which, I'm stating this as my opinion now, in which sensual experiences are all sexual or proto-sexual. There's no other sensuality in your life. But a lot, you know, people kind of look at things that way. We do not live in a sensual, sensuous world. And you look back in time and you, you go back to pre-verbal times or even back into life among the ancients or people from what we love, we love to call primitive culture, the Mayans, for example, primitive. People in the South Pacific today, primitive. We love to say that. Or even the extremely uh, verbal and conceptual people, some you know, you know, ancient Greek and Rome and Egyptian, my specialty, primitive in a certain way, because you know they didn't have cell phones. You've got to be primitive. If you don't have a cell phone, you can draw the line somewhere. There's always these lines to be drawn. You've got to be primitive if you don't have reading and writing. You've got to be primitive 
if you don't have a religion a philo- or a philosophy or a government. Boy, that's a biggie. You've got to be primitive if you don't have a government as we think about what a government is. Well, I don't know. You know that's a strange definition of primitive. But where the heck, where the heck am I? Where the heck am I going? I do want to talk a little bit, bit about a topic which I intend to address in a more formal way with lots of fancy research and whatever at some point, which is where does sex fit into people's lives? And I'm not talking about people who, you know, go to sex workshops, that kind of thing, because they kind of know, or are supposed to know, where sex fits into their lives. On the other hand, that's a way of putting sex into a box. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a great believer in sexuality, sensuality workshops and sessions. My friend Anita Di Francesco holds and teaches a number of such workshops, and they are exceptional. And she's obviously not the only one. There are people I happen to know her and admire her particularly, but she's definitely not the only one. But for your ordinary, what was the expression I heard the other day? Jill and Joe. Well, for your ordinary Jill and Joe, where does sex fit into their lives? Fascinating question. And again, I'm going to do some, like, my usual kind of scholarly research on that topic and see what I come up with. But for the moment, I'm just going to ask another question I'm asking. But it, it's interesting. For a lot of people, let me just say, sex is a form of stress relief. And you can, again, go back in time. Well, primitive people had stress. And the ancient Greeks and Romans had stress. And all these people, feeling, people fighting wars, well, they sure as hell had stress. And people have been fighting wars since the beginning of time. People in just about every business have stress. I mean, I am in a business that is known for stress, namely the motion picture industry. And people say it's so stressful. Well, you know, I was always the unstressful person. I would be talking to some coked-up agent, and the first thing he does is yell and scream at you. <laughs> he doesn't even know what he's yelling and screaming about. <laughs> and I find, oh, after a while, I let him scream and scream for a few minutes, never scream back at him, and then we start talking like normal people. And yeah, that's our business, and there's a problem, and we attend to it, the blah, 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 blah. But people have stress. Although people have stress because of the pressure of their jobs. Amazon employees. That's the famous example now from the current environment in which we live in. An example that we've all, we've all heard. But believe me, I mean, people working split shifts where they don't have a regular schedule, where they have to show up at crazy, you know, crazy-ass hours. Uh, people who have difficult bosses. The worst kind of bosses, we're going to talk about this more in a second, are the bosses and co-workers with no sense of humor. There are so many humorless people out there. If you look at it from a certain perspective, they seem crazy. I come from a humorless family. Okay? My parents simply had no sense of humor. My sibling has no sense of humor. It's a thing in our family. And if they seem to be humorous for a second, uh, they're really not. Gotta watch out. Humor is never really funny. Are those, uh, it's kind of like all those people who use humor only when it's a put down, either of you or some, someone else. You know those people. Working with humorless people all day, that's stressful. You may not verbalize it, conceptualize it like that, but that's effing stressful. But there's all kinds of stress. Come on, come on. In the work environment, in your educational environment, every aspect of life Hopefully your spiritual environment isn't stressful, but believe me, there's some aspects of it in some organizations, what they call cults, and others, not just those, in which your life is stressful. Stress. Then there's also the question of stress back in time. 
it's easy for us to think about the kinds of stress that people in the modern world go through. I mentioned a couple of examples and all that sort of thing, but there's also stress in the ancient world. The ancient world fascinates me. I have good friends who study and research the Maya, and that's always a fascinating topic, but that wasn't so much my thing. I was a Regents graduate fellow in Egyptology at a major university. People don't realize that Egyptology is not just a matter of digging things up from the ground. It's not archaeology. Archaeology is a sort of very separate discipline or a sub-discipline within Egyptology. I was more interested in the language and what we could learn from the language in terms of the structure of the language and how people thought. I'm fascinated by the notion of how people thought. I mentioned this in a previous episode, but uh, here's stress for an ancient, ancient Egyptian. One of the major uh, literary works surviving from ancient Egypt, the so-called Middle Kingdom of ancient Egypt, is the story of the eloquent peasant. So here's this poor peasant, and he's trying to move his grain somewhere, and he meets an official. And the official says, as officials have done from the beginning of time until now, you can't do that. Nah, you're not allowed to do that. You're not permitted to move your grain to market, and therefore you're going to well, maybe starve or have a terrible time with things. So the peasant literally talks his way out of it. And it shows the value that the ancient Egyptian civilization placed on eloquence. And you learn a lot about that society just from that. Here's a person under stress, and he gets out of stress by being eloquent. Curious notion. But on the other hand, you take these human beings who, without the wheel, we have to emphasize, built the pyramids. And you ask yourself, what could possibly have been on their minds? What sort of stress, S-T-R-E-S-S, -S, would they have been under for the that person building the the pyramids those hundreds of people building the pyramids and other such things that the ancient Egyptians built if you didn't do right what would happen to you what would happen to you is a source of considerable stress what are you thinking about all day what were you thinking about all day you were thinking about the whip you were thinking about the lash, probably more than you were thinking about the reward. Pharaohs boasted, I gave him bread and beer, tehenket in ancient Egyptian. That's what the pharaoh boasted, probably with zero accuracy, he gave to the working man. But what actually that actual working man had? What was his motivation? The notion of a motivation is really a very modern idea, if you come to think about it. What motivates you if you are a slave? If you are a slave building a pyramid, or if you're a slave doing just about anything, what is your motivation? Excellent question. So, on the one hand, you have punishment, and on the other hand, you have what? On the one hand, you have the threat of being punished, of being whipped, of being starved, of having your family possibly also tortured. That's on the one hand. And what do you have on the other hand? That you will be given some trifle to eat at the end of the day. That you will be given a day of rest? Huh. Do we really know that? Again, have to go back through my texts and see if there's any indication. There's some, but it was specifically what the workers in the pyramids. And as eloquent as the Egyptians were, they were not writing about things like that. And as eloquent as the ancient Greeks were, they were not necessarily writing about that. I'm going to check out and see if there's any Egyptian or Coptic word that in any way mean stress. It would be interesting to go through languages over the course of time in different cultures and say, okay, 
what is this particular culture, both the cultures of the present world and the cultures back through time? What was their idea of stress? Did they have one? I suspect that a lot of the ideas of stress in the ancient world were more ideas about religious stress, ritual stress. Because, believe me, one of the major sources of stress back in time from the very, very beginning was religion. If you don't do something the right way, you're going to get punished. Either, you know, in some kind of afterlife kind of situation, or you're going to get punished by a government that is really the church. I mean, the idea of the separation of church and state is really, really, really new. Some people say, well, you don't really have that yet, but it's neither here nor there. So that's going back and looking at stress through time fascinates me. And then you get the position of sex through time. Sex, what did sex mean in any given culture or society? Plato's famous dialogue about love Everyone says, what did Plato have to say about love? Well, it's largely in a dialogue, in a, a dialogue called the Symposium. And the Symposium is really about sex between men. And that's what it's about. Stressful issues of what do you do if your young boyfriend starts to grow a beard. As if growing a beard was something that made your object of your love less attractive or whatever. It's a whole different world. If you're gay today, you, you probably can identify much more with a symposium than if you're not. And then there's also the issue of humor through time. And again, we know Shakespeare's plays. Some of them are comedies. In, a, you know, in the ancient world, Aristophanes was a writer of comedies. But some of Shakespeare's comedies are maybe kind of obscure, some of the humor is situation, like situation comedy. A lot of it is wordplay. And the wordplay is maybe not that easy to get. And you're watching these actors up on stage, and they're kind of laughing and chuckling, but the wordplay becomes so complex that you kind of sometimes laugh by rote. And I really, I know Shakespeare backwards and forwards, but it's still kind of that way. And you go back in time to the ancient Greeks, and Aristophanes, in the, it's in a certain way, the humor of the ancient Greeks was kind of puerile. Really puerile. I mean, there's a certain amount of bathroom humor and really silly stuff. A philosopher hanging in a tree. and it's, um, But it, it's burlesque in a certain way. You, even the, the, the more famous playwrights, Aristophanes, the most famous ancient Greek playwright of comedy. So there's the ancient world, and it's, it's back there. It's part of us. You don't have to be a Regents graduate fellow in Egyptology to think about the fact that it's, it's part of us. Our ideas about so many things, we try to transform them into our lives today. Someone on Twitter was making certain remarks of, to the effect that if only everyone knew the truth, things would be hunky-dory. I believe, it, believe me, I'm really paraphrasing and really going far away from what he said. But we have this interesting confusion in, in our culture and in the history of philosophy, certainly, between the notions of, of truth in beauty, in right and wrong. As if, if you knew the truth, you would act ethically. If you knew the beautiful, you would act ethically. Are truth and beauty the same? We've come through a really strange history of thought. I blamed Plato for a lot of this in previous, in my, back in my very first episode ever, and I still do. So let's wander back into the mainstream of what I <laughs> plan to talk about today. So where does sex fit in if you're leading a stressful life? Sex as stress relief. It's the big ah. 
hopefully one or both of you has an orgasm. And for the one who, who does, hopefully, and that's unfortunately or is the way of things, things go, it's generally the guy. 70% of the time, women do not orgasm simply from penetration sex with nothing else. So hopefully, you know, you can both orgasm, which is a really complex activity that happens in several stages for a lot of people. Let's just face it. We learn, and Tantra is an interesting way of learning how to have these joint orgasms in consort. But anyway, the orgasm has the big ah. <sighs> Breathing exercises. Anita De Francesco, my friend, teaches breathing, and boy, that's a great way of stress relief. We should all do that. But sex is the big ah for many people. And that's a good thing. But in a certain way, it fits into your schedule, the big ah as stress relief. Kind of like booze or marijuana or one of those other things, you know, ah, I'm doing this for stress relief. Or your meds, they're for stress relief. So that's one way in which sex fits into people's lives. Again, I'm going to do an episode on this, but think about it. Where sex fits into your life. If you're on the make and want to get laid, man or woman, chick or dude, where does it fit in? Is scoring a sensuous activity or another kind of activity? Okay, it's a, it's a truism. It's a trivial to say that, that scoring is, is an ego activity. Is sex an ego activity? Egocentonic, as the psychoanalyst would say? Is it an ego boost to have sex? Is that where sex fits into your life? If you're a man or if you are a woman. And is ego sex sensuous sex? Is ego sex loving sex? Is ego sex spiritual sex? Can you do spiritual sex and have it be, in a certain way, almost primarily... Ego sex? Interesting question. I've succeeded in having sex in such and such a way. Perhaps it's even a ritual type of sex, and I don't put that down. Emphasize, I don't put that down. But is it also possibly ego sex? What's wrong with ego sex? Well, you know, we have stuff from the id stuff that is governed by the superego, that is, id stuff that the superego says, no, 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 he must not do that. It's even deeply ingrained in your psyche from childhood. Well, things you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to have sex in a certain way. Or you're not supposed to have sex for pleasure. You're only, have to ha you're only supposed to have sex for procreation. Well, some people go through life still believing that, I don't know what to say to those people. But to me, these are kind of all interesting interesting questions. And is, again, is ego sex, ego sex, a bad thing? Well, yeah. Sex should make you feel good about yourself and good about the person that you're having sex with. Sex should actually make you like and feel tender feelings and feel gracious feelings and gratitude-type feelings toward the person you are having sex with, even if neither of you define those feelings as love. Sex is, after all, a shared experience. Golly, you're telling me something new? Well, in a certain way, yeah. If you're out there to score... And we talked about this in our most recent episode on casual sex, buck buddy sex, and all those sorts of things. Dogging. 
Uh, drunk dialing sex. There's a there's one that we do here all the time, <laughs> believe it or not. But I mean, it's really, really important to be caring. It's really, really important to be nice. Nice. It's so easy to be nice to somebody. I had as a New Year's resolution, I've talked about this on previous episodes, and people kind of laughed at me. I love it when you laugh at me. It's a good thing. My New Year's resolution a couple of years ago is be the nicest person and the most gracious person that everyone you come in contact during any given day meets during that day. Whether it's the checkout person at Trader Joe's, even if they're not attractive, there's this dynamite girl at my Trader Joe's, i got to tell you. I hope she's not listening to my podcast. If you wear interesting jewelry and have glasses and nice rings, you're the, you're the girl I'm talking to right here. Don't take me seriously. It really hurts when you take me seriously. It's really, really sad. But anyway, let's be nice. Be nice to the person that you are interested in. Be nice to the person you're not interested in. Yeah, you may be a little bit afraid that that person is going to develop an interest in you. that you're not able to return. Alas, it's happened to everybody. It's even happened to me. Just <laughs> yeah, it has. If somebody is, um, you're nice to that to that person of the opposite sex, and they get ideas about you, and just you can't reciprocate those ideas. There's just no nothing. No zaza zoom. I'm going off on a tangent, or what? Is that more geometry here today on explore ecstatic sensuality? But just be nice. Sex with a smile. That's really the topic of this of this episode. Sex with a smile. Humor, just a little bit. A gracious kind of humor, that nice kind of humor. Not, really, not jokey. I know friends who are jokey. I have friends who are jokey. And they're fun as friends, you know. They're making, making jokes. Okay, and that's maybe you can be jokey in the bedroom. That's possible. I haven't experienced that. But for some people, you have like jokey couples. I have no jokey couples. They have a, believe me, jokey couples have a great time with each other. And I rather imagine they also have a great time in the bedroom, just being jokey. Man, oh man, in the next life I plan to be jokey. I think I'm going to have a great time in, the, in that, that next lifetime. But sex with a smile, a relationship with a smile, Yes, yes, there are going to be disagreements. By golly. Yes, there are going to be times when your partner, your loved one, pisses you off big time. There are going to be times when you piss your partner off big time. How to get through those things. Anita DeFrancesco, my friend, has some wonderful episodes on her podcast, Discover Joyous Love, where she talks you through how to get past some of those episodes or encounters. But the important things don't, in my opinion, not necessarily hers, don't allow them to fester. You know, they have to be confronted. They have to be talked through. There was a discussion uh, in one of my earlier episodes about infidelity. That was my episode on cheating. And then Serious discussions of the difference between physical infidelity and emotional infidelity. And how it is possible to, and it happens very often, that you hurt your relationship person, relationship partner, relationship lover, by developing what appears to that partner to be a too affectionate relationship with another person, generally of the opposite sex. And it's called emotional infidelity. It's been studied a lot by psychologists. And it hurts your relationship partner. For women, in some cases, it can be more hurtful than you go off and have a one-night stand. Okay? Happens all the time. I've gone through percentages of relationship people who have one-night stands. I think there was a study that showed that people in good, happy relationships have one-night stands just as many as 
or just as often as people in troubled relationships. One night stands. They're out there. It happens. But emotional infidelity, women in particular feel that that emotional bond has been betrayed. It's something that needs to be talked through. Both women and men need to learn the tools. Both women and men need to know how to have conversations about emotional infidelity. I'm bringing this up just as one relationship, quote-unquote, issue that I've read about and brought up in previous episodes, but it's something that can cause real problems. It can tarnish your relationship. That can be some, like some kind of, I mean, use a horrible word, pus that's growing up like under the skin of a relationship and has to be addressed, dealt with, talked about, talked through. But here again, is this something which can be dealt with only by smiles? No, alas. But smiles are a really good way to start. Smiles are a good way to build up an emotional bond so that issues like emotional infidelity, for example, if they develop, or even, you know, one night stands, whatever, can be dealt with with a smile. Why not deal with these things with a smile? To establish their level of seriousness with a smile. Mutual agreement with a smile of how serious these issues are and how they can be dealt with amicably. Amicus, a friend. Amica, a friend, in a friendly way. Because you and your partner, your lover, are first and foremost your friends. And the moment we lose, and people do, I see it all the time, they lose this notion that their relationship partner is a friend. And you know what? In a certain way, they don't necessarily have to be your best friend. There is a person, a female person in my life, who's probably in a certain sense, always going to be my best friend. She's been my best friend through any number of relationships. And she's my best friend. And she's my, I wouldn't say collaborator, but on a lot of things that we do mutually, we go back and forth all the time. And we trust each other. In a certain way, in a different way, you know, not more necessarily, but than the people that we're with at any given time. But still, that little exegesis, that little digression aside, your lover, your partner, your person, the person that you're intimate with, needs to be your friend and needs to be treated like your friend. And the moment that that person ceases to treat you as a friend, then that's a time to talk it through. you got to talk it through. You know, you don't want to end up like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Well, ugh, you know, celebrities. But that's really not a good example of anything. But you've got to talk it through with friendship. Friendship. So, so important. An amicable, a friendly friendship, if you want to say that. An intimate friendship. A friendship with laughter and humor. Reciprocated and reciprocal concern. Reciprocal and reciprocated care. Affection. Dialogue. It goes on all the time through the proverbial thick and the proverbial thin. Here's another divigation from my afternoon rhetoric on the subject of sex with a smile. And that is, and that is, I have to say, you know, this is not about giving you advice. I know there's a, there are more advice columns and blogs on the internet and everywhere else you might look for them than there are people or individuals or life forms in the universe. I put it to you, there are probably ten times more advice columns, blogs, suggestions for a better life on the internet, etc., etc., than there are life forms in the universe. 
Want to take that bet? Golly, then you got to go out and do a bunch of counting. Anyway, this divagation is on the subject of taking a person that you're interested in, attracted to, seriously. That's good advice in general. It's good advice in business. You know, you're having a business conversation, and it's just very dry and flat, and I want to get off the phone as soon as I can. This person is boring and dull, and, you know, I may not be able to get what I want out of him by, except by badgering him. And I'm a professional negotiator, believe you me. But anyway, so much negotiation is like badgering the other person, saying the same thing over and over and over again. And I grant it works for some people. I've heard very successful negotiators doing exactly that. But on the other hand, there's a, another technique that's, that's maybe equally good or maybe even better, and that is taking the person seriously, which is not so much, oh, I'm going to try to identify with you, I'm going to try to bond with you. I'm going to try to find something in common. We both collect quartz crystals or something like that. Or we both go trout fishing. Blah, 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 blah. No, you know, if you're talking business, nobody wants to talk about your hooks and reels and line and bait. Please leave bait out of it. Yucko pyucko. No, I'm just talking about taking the person seriously. Be really, you know, acknowledge that this is a person that deserves to be taken seriously, but in terms of if you're interested in intimacy with someone, and we're going to talk about intimacy in just a second. So a big topic here that we should have brought up, we have brought up actually in previous episodes, but I want to do it again today. If you want to be intimate with someone, if you're interested in someone in that way, if you're attracted to someone in that kind of a way, generally speaking, well, what you want to do is to take that person seriously. And that goes throughout the entire relationship, all the way through to you know, planning for death. You know, we are planning for death. What does your husband or wife want to do when that moment is apparently to everyone around the bend? What happens with the corpus delecti? Is that the word? What happens with the body? Is it off to Neptune society? I remembered when my mother died and she wanted Neptune society and one of the things I did after she died was call the Neptune Society, and they were all, all ready for her. That's not my choice. And uh, the people out there, you guys know who you are. One person I mentioned earlier in this podcast is going to have to follow my instructions on that. But say, be ready for the time when your husband or wife says, I really want to go back and finish my Ph.D., I've just left it hanging. I'm tired of selling real estate. I'm tired of working in an office. I'm tired of teaching school. Tired of teaching elementary school. I want to go back and finish my doctorate. There's an interesting factor in that, and that is the following. My doctorate is in a fairly obscure field, quite obscure field, and the job openings for assistant professor in that job openings may entail that we have to move somewhere even possibly outside of the country. Every once in a while, job opportunities open up, but they're usually in the Midwest. I know how much you like California. I know how much you like New York, but this is really my life, and I'm wondering if we could adapt to this desire I have. And this conversation may be brought up by either the male or the female member of the partnership, or if it's a same-sex partnership, blah, 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 mutatis mutandis. Another example, it's going to take me a long time to get my contractor's license in California, and even if I do that, there's so much competition, and to really start my own business, you know how hard it's going to be. We've been struggling, even I as a contractor, I'm struggling to buy a house, struggling to do the things that we really want, struggling to have the money to be able to have our third child. You know, you always wanted a daughter. And, you know, why don't we try for that? But here, you know, living in San Diego, I just don't know how we're, we're going to make it. But now, hear me out. I can get my contractor's license in eight months in Alaska. And starting my own business in Juneau would be just a piece of cake. 
Furthermore, there's lots of residential construction opportunities available in, cropping up all the time, in Alaska. Taking your partner seriously. Now, there can be a big fight, blah, 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 I don't know. There's certainly going to be a discussion, probably a heated one in a certain way. But in another, from another perspective, it all comes down to if you've taken your partner seriously all along, these conversations are going to be a lot easier because if you've taken your partner seriously, you know what their dreams are. You know what's really inside of them. You know what makes them tick. You know what is going to fulfill them in life. Fulfillment. Fulfillment in life. Fulfillment in the bedroom. Fulfillment in your career. Fulfillment spiritually. Fulfillment intimately. Fulfillment fulfillment in terms of your family. Extended family. Fulfillment, obviously, in terms of all of your ambitions. Community ambitions. Civic ambitions. Fulfillment. Fulfillment. Be fulfilled. The more fulfilled you are, I will tell you, the more that you will be satisfied in all aspects of your life, including sexually. Ah, Mr. Sensuality, you're just throwing a bunch of baloney at me and you're giving advice just like you said you weren't going to do. Well, I'm going to give advice that way. But again, if you want to, um, if you're interested in someone, attracted to someone, being interested in them, being interested in them at that level, finding out what they they really take, and taking them seriously is really going to get you a long way. In my experience, it's worked really well as a guy interested in women. I've gotten women who are probably much more attractive, according to some standard, than I am, kind of really to take me seriously. Just because I'm truly interested in them just because I truly take those inner things, those real ambitions, those real drives, seriously. So now another divigation. Divigation is my word for the day. I really like divigations. Now uh, another divigation is to, just as at the beginning of this episode, I asked a couple of questions. What does spirituality mean to you? What does sensuality mean to you? What does intimacy mean to you? Really, really good one. And this is the time when you kind of want to uh, put someone under hypnosis and ask them that question under hypnosis. Wouldn't that be fun? Maybe not. Inside the guy's brain, what is intimacy to you. It means, you know, having her not push me away when I try to feel her up. Okay, want to try that? Just maybe. What is intimacy from the woman's point of view? Being able to get a guy to drop the bullshit, drop the facade, so I really have some fucking idea what this person is all about other than a guy on the make sitting here at a bar or sitting at a, you know standing around at a party or in my office or wherever you know, what how can i do that the search for intimacy the quest for intimacy so ask that person and you may need to rephrase it in such a way or maybe not Because it's like really important. It's really important also in general to understand what intimacy means to you. So you start by asking yourself that question. A lot of us could not really answer that in any coherent way or even any incoherent way. There's a lot of um, identification of intimacy with something physical, with something sexual, on the part of men, and I'm rather imagining on the part of some women, but more men than 
than, uh, than, than women, I think. Although, going deeper, does this mean that, that women have a more subtle, uh, non-physical, let's say, emotional definition of what intimacy is? Yeah, you know, that's probably true. But then let's take a moment to look at the notion of teaching. I believe that women have a lot to teach men about intimacy. Now, you're going to say again, Mr. Sensuality, I've read this in all those 25 tetrabytes and 18 billion blogs. It is kind of really important, so I'm just going to kind of skip over it, but I'm also going to say it because it deserves to be said Again, men go through life with a notion in some way that intimacy is bad. If a man is intimate, if a boy is intimate with another boy, I'm not talking about physically intimate. I'm talking about being able to talk about serious stuff. I had a a couple of friends in high school, and we used to spend a long time on the phone You know, we're both straight, interested in girls. We talked about girls we were interested in back and forth. I don't know how far he got. I didn't necessarily get very far with the girl I was interested in. Are you out there, Darl Ponder? You were a a year ahead of me, and you were really seriously cute. I'm talking about all these women I had crushes on over the course of time. But... You know, we had those conversations. We we talked about other things, our ambitions and whatever, in, in ways that maybe teenagers aren't supposed to talk about with. I think we were a little bit unusual in that a lot of guys go through life, boys, I'll say in this case, boys, go through life feeling that this isn't the thing to do. And it's it's curious, and they look at their fathers, and their fathers don't necessarily do that. You know, it's a curious thing. So, wrapping up this divigation on the subject of taking people seriously, and and the I word, intimacy. On the subject of intimacy, and this is going to be one of those you heard it here first announcements, I have just received a $10 million grant from the National Academy of Sciences jointly with the American Philosophical Association to engage in an international multicultural study of intimacy, of how intimacy is viewed among people men, women, heterosexuals, and otherwise, all along the LGBTQ queer spectrum, as well as the rest of us, their views of intimacy. If you notice the clickbait title of this episode, and believe me, I'm the high priest of the clickbait, known far and wide as that, if you notice the title of the episode, It reads, Sex with a Smile, Five Questions, and No Answers. Well, let's count how many questions we've asked so far. What does spirituality mean to you? Yeah, we did this one. What does sensuality mean to you? Yeah, we did that one too. What does intimacy mean to you? Well, we asked that. These are all questions, mind you. What does love mean to you? Well, let's, uh, maybe we should talk about that a little bit more. And finally, what does sex mean to you? Wow. We kind of touched on that tangentially, or as someone I know says, tangentially. He must be tanning his genitals. I think this is a male testosterone encouraging thing that people are that guys are supposed to do go out and tan their genitals so we talked about that tangentially but i want to go back for a second to the question what does love mean to you and just as a reminder these are questions to ask yourself these are questions to ask any person that you're intimate with or in a relationship situation in particular because I think they're pretty good. I'm just patting myself on the back here, throwing flowers at myself. 
So back to love for a second. I'm going to read you some things that the philosopher Alain Badiou wrote recently, published recently uh, in 2019. So these more or less and probably actually represent some of his current views. I have inserted a few comments just because that's the kind of thing that I do. Quoting Badiou, Philosophy, or a philosophy, founds its place of thought on rejections and on declarations. In general, the rejection of the sophists and the declaration that there are truths. In this case, there will be 1. The rejection of the fusional conception of love. Love is not that which makes a one in ecstasy through a two supposedly given. This rejection is in its foundation identical to that which dismisses being for death. I repeat, this rejection is in its foundation identical to that which dismisses being for death. The concept that our being is ultimately only for the purpose of our death. This is because an ecstatic one can only be supposed beyond the two as a suppression of the multiple. Hence, the metaphor of night, the stubborn sacralizing of the encounter, the terror practiced by the world, Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. In my categories, that is to say body use, this is a figure of disaster, and as such, related to the generic procedure of love. This disaster is not that of love itself, but is the remembrance of a philosopheme, the philosopheme of the one. For Badiou, here I'm inserting a comment, for Badiou, everything is a multiplicity of multiplicities. I take this to mean that any imposition of a notion of the one is constraining, inimical to freedom, expansion, and growth and that any imposition of the one is a denial of infinity, including a denial of the infinity of love, of the infinite possibilities and potentials of love. The myth that lovers somehow fuse into a one limits love by limiting the growth, identity, and creativity of the lovers. 2. The rejection of the ablative conception of love. Love is not the prostration of the same on the altar of the other. I maintain that love is not even an experience of the other. It is an experience of the world, or of the situation under the post-evental condition that there were two. I wish to subtract eros from the entire dialectic of the heteros, of the other, Hetero, as in heterosexual, for example. 3. The rejection of the superstructural or illusory conception of love, dear to a pessimistic tradition of French moralists. I understand by this that the conception of love is merely an ornamental semblance through which passes the real of sex, or that desire and sexual jealousy are the foundations of love. Jacques Lacan occasionally skirts this idea, for example, when he says that love is what fills in, souple, the failure of the sexual relation. But he also says the opposite, when he accords to love an ontological vocation, that is the edge, a bore, of being. But love, I believe, does not take the place of anything, souple. It supplements, which is completely different. It is only messed up under the fallacious supposition that it is a relation. But it is not. Love is a production of truth. The truth of what? That the two, and not only the one, are at work in the situation. 4. Love is not an annihilation of identity. This is the Sartrean route the route followed by Jean-Paul Sartre, of whom actually on our side we are quite fond, but that's an aside for me. So I'm beginning again with number four. Love is not the annihilation of identity. This is the Sartrean route 
Consciousness is nothingness, and it has no position by itself beyond being self-conscious or non-thetic consciousness of the self. But, to put this pure transparency to a test, it is well known what becomes of love for Sark. An impotent oscillation between sadism, making the other into an in-itself, and masochism, turning oneself into an object for the other, which means that the two are only a machination of the one. Body you hear inserts the following sentence, which I think is key. We can thus say that love is precisely this, the advent, love in mon, of the two as such, the stage of the two. Let me repeat that. We can thus say that love is precisely this, the advent of the two as such, the stage of the two. So, having listened to all of this, which I find quite fascinating and illuminating, particularly in Badiou's rejection of this notion of the one, which is a general, as we said a moment ago, rejection of the whole idea, even the notion of one universe, and we referred to philosopher David Lewis's concept of multiple universes, multiple worlds, how experience and the self and the me and the you are constantly branching out into other possibilities which exists equally with what appears to be the real, not in the Lacanian sense necessarily. So we refer to this and it strikes me as something that's very important. But let's go back to asking ourselves that question, asking your beloved person you wish to have in your life, again, not as a one, but as this other thing, as this truth procedure of love, as body, you might say. What does love mean to you? The question, again, for the self and for, quote-unquote, the other. And uh, there is a fifth question. I promised you that, and I always keep my promises as best I can. What does sex mean to you? It's a big question, and it's almost the kind of question like, yeah, you know, um, the sky is blue. Why is the sky blue? Well, there's a big, long scientific explanation for that that, you know, we don't want to have to go back to high school to, to learn again. But no, it's a real, real, real question. They talk about things like sex education and uh, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. What does sex mean to you? We were talking earlier about where sex fits into people's lives in the ordinary world, but that's only part of it. The whole notion of sex is sex pleasure. And again, I think we kind of asked the question parenthetically earlier, what does pleasure mean to you? Does sex mean pleasure? Does sex mean intimacy? Does sex mean sensuality? Does sex mean love? Is sex a subset of these things in some way? What does it mean to you? What does it mean in your heart? What does it mean in your mind? How much of your motivations? We talked earlier about what motivates people, the whole notion of motivation a kind of a modern world in a certain way. The person who grows up in the Middle Ages or before or farther back in time knowing that he is going to do the same thing with his life that his father did. He's going to be a blacksmith just like his father was. He's going to be a farmer just like his father was. Where is the notion of motivation? Is he motivated to buy a larger field? Is he motivated to buy a larger blacksmith shop? What are the motivations? The motivations are somehow constrained and confined in that particular track. We turn around to sex. How much of our behavior, the things that we do, how much of that is motivated by a sex drive, the pleasure principle, lust principles, as Freud said? And how much of that is constrained by the totus tree, the death drive, 
Are these warring forces in all of our lives that govern our motivations, that govern our and limit our sensuality and limit our love? Is love, in fact, limited by sex? Is love limited by the possibilities of sex for any individual? Can one go through life with the aching concept, the aching, aching thought, the aching substrate in one's mentality that one's love is limited by? Love is limited by what one is allowed to do, what one is physically capable of doing sexually. Does this mean that love is not the all-expansive force? Love is everything, the kind of thing people say. Love conquers all. Amor omnia vincet. Or amor omnia vincet. So many ways of pronouncing Latin. Think about it. So those, in summary, are the five questions. One more thing. <laughs> you know me well enough to know there'd be one more thing. And that one more thing is to say that this podcast video series, wherever you're accessing it, is a podcast for everyone, for every adult, I suppose, including college-age individuals and all through all the way, and hopefully it is for LGBTQ people, queer people, as well as for straight people. I really hope so, and I want to do more in the future talking about issues and things of importance to LGBTQ people. I think it's important in this day and age. But that having been said, I mentioned toward the very beginning of this particular episode, Sex with a Smile, that many people we know in our lives live in a kind of spiritual bubble or alternate medicine, alternate therapy, alternate sex attitude bubble. And I said also at the very beginning that people don't speak spiritual, or here's another word, spiritualese. We get into a kind of vocabulary even in that regard. And sometimes we say words that do not mean the same as they might to someone in the general population, as it's known, in the Gallup polls, whatever, whatever that is. What I want to do is to kind of make a little bit of a bridge, hopefully. My last episode included some quotations from blogs that purport to give sex advice. And they're, they're everywhere. They're in the, in the online now, mainly. There are fewer newspapers and magazines than there were even four or five years ago. However, if I look at these columns, I see kind of more typical real-world questions and answers. So in my last episode, I quoted from some of these, and I have to confess it was partially with humorous intent, and I wonder if some of them might even have been posted or written in books originally with humorous intent. I'm not going to ask. There's a fine line. All this having been said, a typical question asked would be something like, now that we're married, my husband doesn't want to have sex anymore. Or, we went out a couple of times, and I'm not sure about him, and I have the feeling that he really wants to sleep with me when we go out on Saturday. These are the sorts of things. In-law questions about, about sex. Occasionally. These are the things that come up in the so-called real world. Occasionally you have things about issues of religion, issues of politics. Oh, my Lord. Those come up from time to time quite frequently. I'm quite aware of those things in terms of differing, divergent political views. So I want to bridge that gap. And I'm sure someone's going to tell me, you're not real world enough. And I'm sure the other person's going to tell me, 
you're not spiritual enough, you're too silly about these topics, you talk about things that I, I don't really, I don't want really to talk about things. I don't want to talk about polyamory, casual sex, some of the topics that we've raised on this show, limerence, sexual obsession that we've talked about on this show, and try to give these topics a sympathetic light. And my attitude is that there is not a straightforward, simple, spiritual answer to any of these questions. And if you go out again in the general population per the Gallup poll, and you address people and you tell them what the spiritual answer is, and as I said a, a bit earlier in today's episode, it becomes like facing them with another form of control is if they get rid of one and they're told to adopt another. So again, this podcast, Explore Ecstatic Sensuality, is indeed a way not only to open people's minds and hearts and bodies to sensuous life, sensuous love, but it's also a way to realize that at the end of the day, we're all in this together. We're all in this to learn from each other and to learn from a variety of sources, and I hope from time to time I can be one of them. Thank you.